primer, uh, en primer lugar, first of all, uh, muchas gracias uh, por la amable invitación. Uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. My is really a special place. Uh, I just noticed that I'm among few who's, not, who's neither government official nor businessman who's here, so I'm going to be more like the Don Quixote character here, and be more honest and open. Hopefully one day I'll be either polite enough to be a diplomat or rich enough to be a businessman. Um, I know I'm in Institute de Cervantes, but let me quote Charles Dickens, or rather paraphrase Charles Dickens when he said, you know, those were the best of times and the worst of times. I would rather say these are the worst of times, but also the best of times. The worst of times because, actually the last year at this point, I was also in Europe, but for the Munich Security Conference, uh, only a few days later, we really saw what uh, historian Adam Hughes calls polycrisis, the convergence of multiple engines of crisis, each of them with their own dynamic, right? We have never had something like that. You know, we had the Great Recession in 2008, 2007, we, we know that the engine was in the US. And then of course, later on, we had the sovereign debt crisis here. I, hope, I, I can see you guys have fully recovered. Um, so the engine was here. But now we see multiple centers of crisis converging. Of course, as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, uh, it's a new Cold War between US and China. And it doesn't take to, you know, it doesn't take shooting down a balloon with F-22 for us to know how serious the situation here is. Just very quickly, four points. Of course, I'm going to cheat and say, if you really want to know about my ideas on the Pacific, you can read my book. The title is The Indo Pacific. It's quite easy to find on Amazon. But first of all, let me. So, four quick points. First of all, as far as the Philippines and uh, Spanish relations is concerned, we always say it's a special relationship, but we want to make sure it's not the kind of special relationship that the United States and the United Kingdom have, right? A very asymmetrical special relationship. We want to make it as symmetrical as possible. And we want to make sure that Spain takes Philippines on its own terms, not a gateway to China, a la Galleon trade. Or, and we want to take Spain on its own terms and not just talk about Spain as one of those guys in the European Union. Although, of course, UK is not only part of you. Now, the thing about Spain, and I always found this fascinating, is the transformation you have made in the past few decades into becoming really a full-fledged industrialized country and really a progressive democracy. I mean, I usually visit Barcelona, I can see how the Anarchista, Marxista, all of them are having a great time. And I wonder when we're going to have that back in the Philippines, but now we'll be done with Don Quixote. Um, and we knew, we know that not long ago, no, just half a century ago, the situation in Spain was not very different from the situation in the Philippines back then. You have your own Codillo, we have our own Codillo. So this transformation is something that I think it can serve as a role model for the Philippines as we try to also become a much more full-fledged democracy, stable, and more industrialized country. Now, which brings me to the second point. If you look at the Philippines today, it's no longer a marginal country. For a long time, we said the Philippines is special because of our geographic position. But actually what makes the Philippines more special nowadays is our geopolitical position. But even before discussing that, let's just look at the Philippine economy. One of the interesting trends that Philippine economists like Rishi Sharma have noticed is that over the past few years, Asia, particularly ASEAN, is less dependent on China as a source of growth. So for instance, the World Bank said a single point deduction in China could lead to 0.4 deduction in Indonesia, 0.2 deduction in the Philippines. But we're not seeing any more evidence of that. It's progressively going down because ASEAN countries like the Philippines, like Vietnam and Indonesia are becoming growth engines on their own terms. Last year we grew at 7.6%, right? The fastest we have experienced. The last time we grew as fast, paradoxically or interestingly, was under Marcos Senior in the mid 1970s. And now Marcos Jr. is overseeing one of the fastest growth. You can see I'm faster than you guys looking at me. I have a lot of good things to say about our country. Now the thing also with the Philippines is that we're one of the engines of an emerging ASEAN market. So if you look at the combined ASEAN market, this is gonna be in the top five biggest economies in the world, and Indonesia alone, by the middle of this century, could be the third or fourth largest economy in the world. Really, the competition is India, China, and to a certain degree, the United States. So Philippines is in that growth pole, and sustaining that growth, even in spite of the slowdown in China, the threats of recession in the United States, and of course the energy crisis that we'll have here in Europe, and we want to continue with that. But what makes the Philippines more special to you guys here in Spain? And uh, Don Emilio talked about it a while ago, the infrastructure issue. Uh, we are transitioning from a hundred billion dollar building bit infrastructure plan under President Duterte with certain degree of success, and now we're talking about 320 billion dollar infrastructure development plan 
which uh, NEDA Secretary Balisaka and among others unveiled in their visit to Frankfurt not long ago. Now, interestingly, while the previous Guild Bill bid was much more reliant on government financing and ODA, now thanks to the return of Secretary Balisaka, we're looking at more public private partnerships. And I think that's where we create a lot of opportunities for us to work with our new counterparts in Spain and look forward to the next sessions on business and economics to learn more about this thing. But the other thing that makes also the Philippines very interesting is other sectors that we don't pay attention to. For instance, the fintech sector in the Philippines is going to be $44 billion strong by next year. I know a lot of people talk about C in Singapore or Gojek in Indonesia. But watch out for the Philippines. We're making huge moves. Just look at ANCAS, for instance, by our good friend George. Just in the past three years, you know, now it's in a good position to be a unicorn uh, in the coming years. And much, much more is to come as digital economy transforms the Philippines and its place in the world. But this is where let's go to the more interesting part. Now, if you look at the Philippines, I've written a lot, I mean, probably 2,000 articles just on the Philippines alone over the past 10 years. I've criticized almost all the presidents. But let me say, let me put it this way. I think, thanks to all of our three presidents in the past three decades, past decades, sorry, the Philippines right now is in a strategic sweet spot. Aquino proved to the world that the Philippines can be a responsible stakeholder and also a middle power in its own right. Our arbitration case in South China Sea is very much a denouement of that. President Duterte at the same time showed that the United States can no longer take us for granted and that the Philippines has to be won over and that we have other options. And now thanks to President Marcos Jr., we are in a position to launch what we call multi-vector loans. And we call them academics. No one cares about us, but this is going to be more and more how the Philippine foreign policy is going to look at. It. But at the same time, of course, we know that as much as the Philippines is in a strategic sweet spot, we have also made some major decisions that is going to make us more relevant to the West, including the recent decision to grant Americans access not to keep, not only key bases close to the South China Sea, but also key bases close to Taiwan. We just don't know how far north this is going to go. Is it just going to stop in Cagayan and Isabel in the northern Philippines? Or is this going to go all the way to Fuga Island and Memulis, which are very, very close to the southern shores of Taiwan? So as much as we are diversifying, you know, trying to build relationship, golden era with China, great relationship with the United States, we are very much pivotal to the future of America's strategy in the region. And this is also important for us because we want to have leverage when we deal with China. We want to have a say and to be prepared for whatever contingency could come in the South China Sea and Taiwan. Going to the last point. And last one, this is where middle power diplomacy comes to the picture. If you look at it, both Spain and the Philippines actually very much match the basic definition of what is a middle power. Middle powers essentially are not big enough to be superpower, but they're just big enough to have a certain degree of strategic autonomy. More than that, they have a certain level of influence and prestige and respect that they enjoy, and they have coalition building capabilities. I think the Philippines has proven that. I think our good friends in the DFA have proven that on so many fronts over the past six and seven decades. And we often forget the central role that the Philippines played in the development of the global human rights regime, for instance, in the United Nations. And even with the changes of the administration, you can see, in fact, the Philippines is the only country in ASEAN that consistently favored Ukraine, as far as any major vote came up. You know, thanks to our current secretary and former ambassador to UN, Manalo, among others, we really took a principled position as far as the Ukraine issue is concerned, without unnecessarily, of course, antagonizing China, uh, Russia, right? Which shows the sophistication that the Philippines is bringing to the diplomatic picture. As far as Spain is concerned, you're already a $1.4 trillion economy, which is pretty large, even slightly larger than Indonesia. So you're not a small player, or you're no longer a small player anymore. And you're part of the G20 as an extension, and you have a lot to offer us on the infrastructure front, but also on geopolitical front. I mean, I got to know that Emilio now is the ambassador at large for the Pacific since last year. I'm very excited for this, because we noticed a lot when France did that, right? Mm -hmm. Now we see uh, Spain is part of the picture. Now the good news is that if you look at President Marcos Jr., yes, he has made a big decision on the EDCA front. And I've argued that this is going to lock us into almost America's integrated deterrence strategy. But I'm also very sure that President Marcos Jr. is someone who wants to ensure that we don't become overly dependent on the United States and that the entirety of our foreign policy is not defined by the new Cold War competition among superpowers. 
And that is why I'm very confident that President Marcos Jr. in the coming months and coming years, I think a, a visit to Elisi Palace could also be in the works after his visit to the White House later this year. He's going to reach out to Europe and he's going to reach out to you, our friends here in Spain and others, because we want to make sure that our foreign policy is as diversified as possible and that we make sure that we can make the most out of EU's own people today in the Pacific as you guys recognize the importance of the region. So in short, I think we're in a distinct position to recognize each other's merit on our own terms. Philippines on its own terms, it's no longer just a marginal country, just a gateway to China, and also Spain on its own terms as we get to talk about it more. Thank you very much and looking forward to more discussion.